All right, well, thank you for coming. My name is Adam Lavely. I'm here to talk about uh, getting up and running introduction to high performance computing on the ICS ACI cluster. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about compil uh, compilation as well as some parallelization techniques. I would suggest to you all that you compile your own codes. Uh, we've already broke one of my cardinal rules and used MATLAB on the HPC resources. Um, MATLAB is great. It has a lot of wonderful functions. But if you're trying to run a lot of things or trying to run very quickly, uh, you should almost always be using something that you've written either yourself or that somebody else has written in um, a full programming language and not a scripting language like Python or MATLAB. Uh, this is going to be considerably faster. Uh, and then one of the other nice things is that it's going to be far more portable between systems. I'm coming back to this again and again because it's very important. Uh, it'll be a lot faster unless you're starting to use some wrappers. It is possible to call, say, C code from Python or from MATLAB. But again, that takes a little bit and you're almost better off just writing it completely in C or Fortran. Uh, with your own compiled code, you also have a lot more uh, control over the, the memory as well as the CPU. Um, you won't have a GUI, uh, you won't have any of the, the bulk that comes along with the scripting language. You, you can use far fewer resources for the same thing. And then again, far fewer resources mean that it's going to be considerably faster unless you're using some specialty functions that you just uh, can't compile or can't find on your own. I also highly suggest that even though we have a lot of compiled system modules on the system available to you, that you compile your own versions of these things. Uh, one of the, the main reasons to do this is that you have full control over the version that you use then. Uh, we have a lot of people that want to use things as soon as they come out. Uh, we can't put things on the system that quickly. And so it, if you need access to the uh, things that are coming out very quickly, you, you're almost always better off doing this yourself. The other thing is that if you have something that works and you don't want to upgrade it, um, you can keep your tried and true version running for as long as you want, as long as you're using codes that you've compiled by yourself. Uh, with this, you also have portability between systems. Uh, for example, if you use some of the NSF systems, the version of Intel and the version of GCC that they have available there uh, might be different from the versions that we have here. Uh, and so if you're doing a lot of things that you're swapping files back and forth, it's very important to, to keep everything as consistent as possible. With this, you're also going to have uh, far more control over your own progress. You're not going to be waiting on either ICS or some system administrator on some other system to get something up and loaded. Um, and then there's also another thing. You have the potential to speed up your own codes. Uh, in my own PhD research, I, I used a, a code called OpenFoam, which is um, a, a very large code that has a lot of different things in it. And I actually found that I, I didn't compile the uh, so a portion of it that's used primarily for financial analysis. I was um, interested in the, the CFD portion. If I didn't control the portion that was used for financial analysis, I was able to optimize about two levels higher, and so my code ran uh, 15 to 20 percent faster than if I compiled the entire thing. With any of the system modules, we're going to have to compile just about everything that there is, and so there is the potential that you might be able to speed up what you're doing if you're only using a portion of um, whatever code you're using. So when you're choosing a language, um, well, when you're compiling your own code, you're going to have to both choose a language to write your code in as well as a compiler to, uh, to compile with. Uh, and so there, there's really no wrong answer as well as no right answer either for the language or for the compiler. Uh, there's a couple of things to think about with the language. Now, use something that you're familiar with. If you have to teach yourself something new before you can even write, it's probably going to take you longer, although it, it, it might help you in the long run to, to learn some new things. Uh, you can also use what's best suited for the task. There's a lot of uh, programming languages that have built-in functionality that you might be able to take advantage of and not have to write nearly as much. And then also, if you poke around online, uh, for example, with GitHub or on uh, Stack Overflow, there might be some tools that are already available to you. Uh, it's almost always going to be faster for you to start with something that does something similar to what you do and modify a little bit rather than build it from the ground up. Um, and so if you do, or I, I suggest that you poke around and, and look to see if there are some other things available uh, and then use and cite these other tools. With your compiler choices, um, I always suggest that you compile and well develop and optimize with what you have available to you. 
Um, and then if you get on another system where there's other things available uh, to try other things. And uh, to come back to a point that I, I made earlier, if you have a, a small, the minimal working example, you can do uh, a lot of these tests with different optimizations or different compilers um, and see which one works best on, on the system that you're running on. Uh, so that the most commonly available compiler is probably the GNU compiler suite. Um, and generally the fastest is going to be the Intel uh, compiler, especially on ACI because we have Intel chips. The Intel compiler is uh, significantly faster than the, the GNU compiler. Um, so one of the suggestions that I have is that when you're compiling, when you're actually going to be compiling to do either large runs or mini runs, that you compile on the nodes that you run on. So it's possible to submit an interactive job on ACIB. Uh, so this will bring up a terminal window, and basically it looks like you're on um, ACI, uh, but you're actually on the, the nodes that you're using. So you'll do this with QSub, and then a minus capital I for interactive. And then when you're doing this, because you're not using a submission script, you have to put all of the PBS directives um, with the QSub command on the command line. So we use minus A for the allocation, minus capital N for some sort of name, and then minus L for your wall time and your memory request. Um, and then I, I also suggest that you actually know what you're using. Uh, and so you can use module load GCC, uh, which will load the default GCC module, but if you use module load GCC 5.3.1 and give it the version number, uh, you have more confidence in, in what you're using. Uh, there are a couple of different commands that I suggest you get to know. So the which command tells you where the, um, the executable that you're running is located. And then almost all um, programs that, uh, that are out there will have some sort of way to not actually run the code, but just to give you information about the version number. So the GCC, that's minus V. So you can just run GCC minus V and it'll tell you um, some more specific information about the, the version that you're using. Right, so the, the next step is going to be to compile your own code and to actually run it. Uh, and so on this next slide, we'll talk about the, the different things that are required for the compilation. So our compilation command, this gcc minus o2 minus lm minus o hello.out hello.c, um, there's a, a couple of different things going on here. So we have the, the compiler, so I'm, here I'm using the gcc compiler. And then the O2, this is an optimization flag. Um, LM, so the minus L is a link to a, a library. So with GCC, the, the math library is actually named M instead of math. So minus LM means that we're going to be using the math library. The minus O hello.out uh, tells what the name of the output file should be. I think by default, all of the compilers will write out A.out as the executable name unless you tell it what output name or what the output name should be. And then hello.c is our input file. All right, so a little bit about optimization. We're going to talk uh, through all the different things that we use with the compiler. Uh, the best way to optimize is almost always to code better. Um, the, the optimization flags that you can give will help a little bit, but almost all of the, the things that take the most RAM, take the most CPU, are things that you have control over when you're, com or when you're actually writing your code and not things that you have control over when you're compiling. Um, so watch your input and output. This is far slower than actual compute. Um, and then also allocate and deallocate memory when you need to use it. Um, and then I mentioned before using libraries to do common tasks. You know, Petsy and Boost are, are great things that um, that have a, a lot of functions that do many different things. Uh, chances are at the, the base of it, uh, what you're doing, whether it's solving a partial differential equation or something like that, there, there's many other people that do that, and so you don't necessarily have to write your own. And if you use a library that's out there, it might be far faster than anything you're doing. So if you are trying to optimize with the command line, the uh, compiler flags are available to you. So you can use the, the minus capital O and then specify a level. Um, so minus O is just the base optimization. O1 is a little bit more, O2 is even more, and O3 is the highest with GCC and Intel right now. Uh, so when you do these optimizations, it's typically going to increase the amount of time that it takes for your code to compile. But if you're going to be running many different times, you know, having a little bit longer compile time for far, far faster compute time later on down the road is, is worth it. And the optimizations will almost always increase your executable size. Um, but one thing to note is that the different optimization techniques that are in these 
different levels aren't going to help everything. And so again, uh, use your minimal working example and test the different optimization suites. For, for a lot of what I do, uh, the O2 is actually faster than the O3. When I turn on the O3, the, the way that my code uh, is written, it's, it's not able to take advantage of any of those things. And so O2 is as, as good as I can do. All right, so in our example, we were linking to the math library. There's several different ways to link to different pre-compiled libraries. So the minus capital L, so this is uh, capital L is in love. Uh, this is giving a path to a library. So for example, if you're compiling your code and you're linking to a lot of different libraries that are all, all within a single directory, you can link to just the path. Um, the compiler will search through those and find things as, as required. You can also link to a, a specific library. So we link to the, the math library. So the minus L, so this is a lowercase l, is in lowercase l, love. Uh, and then you give it the library name. And then you can also, uh, for some things, you have to link to the, the header file uh, for the library. And so that's a minus capital I, as in Iowa, um, to give it to a path to the header file. There's a couple of different types of libraries that you will use. The most common is going to be some sort of library that's already on the system. We've talked about these, MKL, Boost, or Petsy. Um, there's a lot of different functionality within uh, each of those different modules, and so you can link to those um, and probably speed your code up quite a bit. Uh, you can compile your own, um, and so these are things that you would compile. Say, for example, if I want a newer version of Petsy than what's on the system, I can compile my own Petsy and then link to that instead of linking to the system version of Petsy. And then you can also write your own libraries. So, for example, um, I do quite a few atmospheric boundary layer simulations, and so with that, I have a couple of different um, specialized FFT functions that I've written that are used by several different codes, and so rather than include those in each separate code that I write, I've written it out to a library, and each one of the codes that I've written then looks at that library. So if you have some shared functionality between a lot of different codes, you can compile that once as a library and then call that from your other codes. There are some ways to find what's available uh, on the system using the module show command. So the module show will actually tell you exactly what's done to your environment when you load that module. And a part of this is appending your path, an LD library path, with the locations for the libraries. Uh, and so you can use the module show command to be able to find the directories to look at when you're trying to figure out um, where these libraries are for linking your own code. You can also use the locate command. Um, the locate will find anything that's in certain directories on the system um, that can be very helpful, very powerful. Uh, but I, I do want to caution you that that will find all the different versions of that library. And so that if there's a version that's compiled with GCC as well as one that's compiled with Intel, be very careful that you know um, exactly what you're using. Uh, the find command is, can also be very helpful, especially when you're looking through your own files. So um, here the example that I give is find, then space period. So that means look in the current working directory. Um, and then minus name, so we're giving the flag name. We're telling it to look for a specific name. And then you type in whatever the library name is. Um, the asterisk is the wildcard. And so uh, in particular, if you don't know exactly what the, the name of the, the library is, um, you might be able to use some wildcards to, to help you find it. Uh, and then if you already have either a library that's, um, that's been compiled or an executable that's been compiled, you can look to see uh, what libraries were used for that with the LDD command. So you use LDD and then either the library name or the executable name. Uh, this is very helpful if you have something working on one system and you're trying to get it working on another system to be able to understand what libraries are being used there so that you know what to search for on the, the second place you're trying to compile this. All right, so um, with our compilation example, it was very simple, uh, but they can get very complicated very fast, especially if you have a lot of different libraries or a lot of different uh, files. And so there are many different tools that are available to you. Uh, the most common one is probably make, and make utilizes a make file. Uh, and so the make file lists all the files that are required and all the outputs that are needed. Um, and so you can either do uh, a full compile there or link to system libraries. Um, one of the nice things about the make file is that if you run it again, it will only recompile the portions of your compilation process that need to be recompiled because uh, files have been updated. 
So for example, if you have a very large code, and you're only changing a small part of it, you don't have to recompile every portion of it. You just have to recompile the portion that you changed and anything that depends upon that. Um, so GNU has, has some excellent resources that are available for Make. I suggest you check that out and also contact the IAS Center if you have some more questions about using Make. Um, there are some other uh, Make derivatives out there. So CMake, WMake are uh, multi-purpose Make tools and then QMake is a version of Make that's specifically for QT. Uh, there might be some other um, Make-like commands out there available for what you're doing. So um, if you're if you start to see something with the word make in it, it's probably a version of make that's um, hopefully w w might be useful for you when you're compiling your own codes. One of the difficulties with compiling code on ACI is that ACI is a heterogeneous system. Different nodes have different uh, processors on them, and so depending on which processor you're on, you'll have different compilation options available to you. Uh, so this is just something to be aware of when you're compiling your code. Uh, typically what, we'll, what we suggest that you do is that you log in using an interactive job onto the batch system and you compile on the nodes that you're going to be running on. This is by far the easiest way to get both the best optimization as well as a code that you know is going to run uh, when you submit your jobs onto your allocation. All right, so the first thing that we'll need to do is to connect to ACII using Exceed On Demand. And so I've listed the, the host name here that you'll type in. Uh, within Exceed On Demand, which is available for download on the ICS website. You'll use your Penn State user ID and password. Um, these work as long as you have an ICS account. Uh, and then you'll also use your two-factor authentication. Uh, I've listed an xconfig and xstart setting here. Uh, these are typically ones that work for just about everybody. There might be something that works better for you, so if you know of something else, please feel free to use that. Uh, and then once you have Exceed On Demand open, um, you're going to start a terminal session, so you'll do that using the Applications menu. Go down to System Tools and then click Terminal. Alright, so now we're going to work through a simple compilation example. Um, and so, either on ACII or ACIB, if you'll change to the, the compilation example directory using the cd command listed there. Um, we're going to take a look first at the, the hello world.c. This is just an example code that I have. And then we'll also take a look at the, the compilation instructions. All right, so um, here are the, the compilation instructions. I have this set up as a script, and so you can either um, run the script or just copy and paste each of the non-comment lines into the command line if you like. So here we're using the Intel 16.0.3 module. Uh, and so instead of using GCC, like the previous example, we're using ICC. Uh, so that's Intel's C compiler. Uh, we have the O2 optimization turned on here. I, I do want to point out that based on the code, all this is doing is hello world, as well as giving the square roots of all the numbers, I think, up to 20. Uh, and so the optimization doesn't actually do anything here, but I'm, I'm putting it in so that you know uh, how to use it. Um, there's the minus o hello.out. So this is telling us what the output file name should be. And then we also have the hello world.c. Uh, our input file name, and again, we're using the, the math library. With the Intel compilers, the, the libraries are actually given after the, uh, the name of the input file. That's just a slight difference from the, the GNU compilers. And so once you do this ICC command to actually compile the code, you'll have a file, a newly created file called hello.out, and then you run that with the period slash hello.out. So that'll tell you hello world from uh, the, the processor that you're on, as well as give you the, the square roots of all the numbers up to 20. So again, you can run this either by um, running the script or by copy and pasting each of the lines out of here. Now that we've done a little bit of compilation, we'll be working on uh, understanding a little bit about parallelization. Um, and so before we get started with parallelization, a couple of the big picture questions you need to ask is how much time do I have to spend on this? And then coupled with that, what am I going to gain from run, running on multiple processors? Uh, parallelization can be fairly difficult to do, um, and a lot of people will actually find that uh, it might not be worth it for them. And so you have to think long and hard about the amount of time, the amount of resources that you have available to spend, uh, as well as what exactly you're going to get from this. 
with this, again, I, I suggest that you look around for other tools that are already available. Um, you might be able to, to get away with um, modifying somebody else's tool and um, spending far less time on it than, than writing something from scratch yourself. Uh, now, if you are going to work on parallelizing your own code, there are some specific questions about the, the task that you're going to be running, the processes that you're going to be running, uh, that you need to think about to be able to understand what sort of parallelization technique uh, you should be using. The specific questions that, that I suggest you, you start to think about are, how do the results from an individual run or individual process influence uh, other runs or other processes? And then with this, you know, how often does that information need to be shared? Um, is it something that you only reconstruct at the very end and so all the processes are independent? Do, you have to, do they have to be communicating fairly often throughout uh, the simulation? And then beyond this, what sort of resources are going to be required? Um, you know, are you going to run into a limit with RAM or with processors? Are, are you going to need to be running on multiple nodes? Because uh, for either the, the amount of memory or then the number of processors that you need to run on, because that does make a large impact on the type of parallelization that you can do. Uh, and then again, what's already available uh, that you can build upon rather than build your own tool from scratch. Parallelization is a little bit difficult, uh, so I'm going to compare this to uh, food distribution styles. And hopefully in that way you'll, you'll understand a few things without necessarily having to know all the terminology that's available. Uh, so one of the ways that we can eat is by all going to a cafeteria. And so everybody goes through the line at their own pace. You grab whatever food you want. Um, nobody's going to be sharing food. You can start to eat whenever you're ready. So for example, the first person in line might already be done eating by the time the last person even uh, gets started. Um, and so th this is a, a multitasking type way of eating. There's a multitasking type way of doing parallelization. There's also what I uh, grew up with uh, for eating, at least, is family style. So this is shared meal. So everybody sits around one table. You have big bowls of different things in the middle. and um, everybody is sharing what's there. Uh, everybody can grab whatever they want and you can pass this around. Only one person has access to things at one time. So if I'm holding the bowl of mashed potatoes, I'll, I might be serving myself and then I have to pass that bowl to somebody else. Uh, but with this, uh, one of the limitations is that there's only one table that's available. And so you might not necessarily be able to have uh, as many people sitting around that table. Um, as you would want, and so that, that is a limitation for family style. But with this, you have a, a lot of shared resources, uh, and uh, you can pass those back and forth, but only one, one person is using individual resources at a given time. And then the, the, last, uh, the last type of, of food distribution method that I'm going to talk about is what I'm calling a formal dinner, where everybody has their own food, and you're all sitting at the table, you're all eating at the same time, um, so everything is done independently, uh, but you're all moving on together, right? So the appetizers all come out together. The main dishes all come out together. The desserts will all come out together. Um, and you can share things, but you have to communicate. You have to say, oh, can I please have some of that? And hopefully whoever you're eating dinner with will say, sure, I'll share with you. Uh, but there, there has to be communication when food is going to be shared. So these are, are similar to the, the three types of parallelization that we have, the multitasking, the sharing, the distributed. So the the first time is the multitasking type job. Um, and so with this, you know, the tasks can run independently from one another. They don't need any information from one another. Um, and then if they do have common information, it means that information is going to be duplicated. Uh, ideally, they wouldn't have any common information at all. Um, with this, you can use more and more processors to decrease the total amount of wall time that your job has to run for, even though the amount of computational time is going to be constant. Uh, and because each of the tasks are independent, you can run on as many different nodes as possible. You don't have to, you're not going to be limited to a single node. So that means that there's no intrinsic limit on either the amount of RAM that's available to you or the amount of processors that you can run on. Uh, there are some excellent tools that are available for this. Uh, GNU Parallel is, is something that I suggest um, a lot of people get to know fairly well. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of good experience getting uh, people's serial jobs running with GNU Parallel on our system. Uh, both MATLAB and Python have tools within them for doing this. Um, and then there are some other specialty tools available like Eden or Nitro for this.
Uh, the second type of paralyzation is shared memory jobs, and so this is like the family style type of eating. Uh, and so you have multiple threads that are all working, but they're sharing the same memory pool. Uh, and so the individual threads aren't going to depend on one another, uh, but they might share information, and so one might have to wait a little bit for the memory to become available to it from whatever other process is going on. Because you have to share all this memory and all the processes uh, need access to the same memory, you're limited to a single node, uh, and with that, the, the RAM that's available on a single node. Uh, and so it's not nearly as easy to go to very large jobs as the, the multitasking method of parallelization. Um, however, there are some um, tools that make this sort of parallelization probably easier to do than other sorts uh, for, for most applications. So within, uh, there's an open MP framework uh, that's built within all the compilers that we have. So you can either use the GCC with a minus F open MP flag or the Intel with the minus Q open MP flag. Um, it, your code is going to need to have some specific directives within that, uh, but it's, it's fairly uh, easy to, to get up and running with this compared to other uh, parallelization techniques. Um, and with this, there's a lot of good tools that are already available. Um, you know, look around online, you might be able to find something that, that's doing something very similar to what you're trying to do. So the, the last sort of parallelization is this distributed memory parallelization. Um, and so with the distributed memory, each task has its own memory, each task has its own set of resources that are available to it. Um, the tasks can communicate, but they'll communicate only at set points. So for example, if you're iterating um, in time, you know, maybe every time step you're going to pass some information back and forth and iterate on that within the time step individually. But you, you do have that dependency between the processors, but the dependency is only at set uh, times, set points that, that you code in. Um, these tasks do pass information back and forth, but again, the tasks have to communicate for that. They have to, to say what they're passing um, and be expecting that from the other tasks. As you might imagine, this can get very complicated very quickly because you have this, what I call bookwork, because you have to keep track of who has what, who's passing what, and when those things are passing, and when those things are being passed. But because you're gonna be communicating, you can communicate across nodes, and so with that, there's really no limit to the amount of RAM that you have access to or the number of processors, because you can just go onto more nodes if you need access to more RAM or more processors. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do this. Uh, the most popular is probably OpenMPI. Intel also has a, a version of MPI available, and then there's MPitch and MVPitch and some other things that are, that are also available. Uh, but OpenMPI and IMPI are probably the, the two most common. Uh, so just before we get started, uh, good parallelization is very difficult. Um, so before you get started, know that you need to do it. Uh, and with that, set aside enough resources, both uh, time and manpower to, to be able to do that. And again, I keep coming back to build using libraries that are already out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There, there's a lot of things that are uh, ready to go that you can just um, you know, use your code to get things in whatever format that library needs and pass it off and do the difficult thing within the libraries. Um, I have this same, this same advice, uh, is this the, the advice that I give for people that are looking to, to move on to some sort of accelerator. Uh, whether that's GPUs or something else, or even on to different cl cluster types. Uh, for example, the, the Cray clusters can be incredibly difficult to get up and running. Um, and then, but if you are running well on a Cray, your jobs, gonna, uh, your jobs are going to run very quickly. You just have to know that you need to do it and set aside the resources to be able to do it. All right, so we have our, our third example today. This is a, a parallel compilation example. Um, and so the first thing that you'll need to do is go to the parallel compilation example directory using the cd command listed here. Um, once you're in there, take a look at the, this is an MPI hello world uh, tutorial. I found this online. Um, the, the link here below is to the, the gentleman's website who wrote this. Uh, and then you can look at the compilation instructions for on ACI using the, the compilation instruction script. Uh, open this with any text editor you like. Um, here I'm using more. So within this compilation example script, uh, you'll see that I first clean our environment and then I'm loading both the Intel module as well as the Intel MPI module. Um, and then I use the MPI CC. 
So this is the MPI version of ICC, um, which we were using before. I'm not doing any optimization here. I'm not doing, uh, I'm not linking to any libraries. You know, so I'm, I'm just writing a single output file with a single input file. Um, and then once this output file is written out, we have to run it in parallel. And so instead of just running the script, we have to use MPI run. So MPI run, you give it NP, so this is the number of processors, and for this example I'm using four, um, and then you give it the, the executable name. Uh, so you can run this directly on ACII by copy or pasting these lines, and then I also have a sample ACI B monitor dot PBS. Uh, this is a submission script. You could submit the same job onto the ACIB batch cluster using the Q sub command. So just a, a, a couple of ex, uh, notes about our example case here. We're using the distributed version of parallelization, MPI. Um, however, if you look through this, you'll realize that all we're doing is saying hello world from each of the individual processors. We're not communicating. So we don't actually need this. Uh, we don't need to have uh, the MPI uh, parallelization method. We could be doing this with any of the other parallelization methods. This isn't really all that important for uh, this example case, but I do want you to know when you're looking at this, we are using MPI, but this isn't necessarily a task that requires MPI. Um, so some of the things that you might want to change around are the, the topology that you're using, so the number of processors per node as well as the number of nodes. Um, and so you can also, with this, change the requested number of processors. Um, so instead of asking for four processors, you could ask for six and run on four, run on five, run on six. Uh, see how that changes your output. And then the other thing, so previously we, we've used the PBS underscore O underscore worker to go to the, direct, or the correct directory. You can also use the PBS underscore task num with the, the MPI run minus MP, this PBS underscore task num, rather than a value. And so this task num will, uh, it's set by the PBS um, or by the job as an environment variable saying how many uh, processors you're actually using from PBS that, that you're requesting. So for example, if you're changing the topology, uh, you might not necessarily always remember to change the number of processors that you're trying to use. So you can use the PBS underscore task num and not have to make that change every time. The final section of our talk is about data. So we'll talk a little bit about data transfer, data storage, uh, primarily on ACI. So uh, in addition to ACI-I and ACI-B, um, ICS also has the data manager nodes. So data mgr.aci.ics.psu.edu. Uh, these exist purely for transferring data. You can't do any sort of runs on those. Um, with the, the data manager nodes, you have access to your homework in Scratch, just like ACIB, ACII, as well as group, if your group has a group directory. Uh, you also have access to the archival storage. Um, and so, for example, if, you're, uh, if you have an archival storage allocation, uh, this is for data that you're not going to be using on a regular basis. You can't run with this data on ACII or ACIB. This is just data that's stored. Uh, a lot of people have to have this for compliance for whatever type of grant that they have, if you have to keep your data around for three years or five years, whatever that, that value is. So the, the archival storage is only available on the data manager nodes, and you just copy files to or from there from other locations. I would recommend if you're doing file transfers from some other location, just because of the way the archival storage is done, that you do the transfer from the, the second location to uh, a persistent location, either group work or scratch, and then once it's on the ACI system, then you transfer it over to the archival storage. Uh, and with this, I highly suggest that you reduce the number of files that you have. That doesn't mean that you're getting rid of files, but you can put all, or you can archive all of your files together using uh, for example, the tar command. So here I'm using tar to archive up an archive that's named to archive.tgz, and it's archiving all the files that are in a directory called all my files. Um, and so if you're transferring large amounts of data, uh, to be able to transfer only a single file instead of many small files is going to be to your great benefit as far as the speed goes. When you're transferring files, there's a, a couple of different methods to use. SCP is probably the most common. Uh, this is used for simple transfers between systems. So 
um, use the SCP minus R. So R is for the recursive. This allows whole directories if you are transferring directories as opposed to a single file like the tar archive from before. Um, and then you use it very much like you use uh, SSH. So it's your username at the name of the system that you're transferring to. Um, and then you give it the location that you're sending it to. Um, so again, this example is for me and my username. Please put your username in there. Um, if you're doing large transfers, use the data manager node. And then this particular transfer is going to your work or to my work directory because it's my name and the tilde is uh, home. Um, but you can use whatever directory that, that you're wanting to do. So the, the command there is scp minus lowercase r. You can use scp both to transfer files from a second location onto ACI or from ACI onto your location. Uh, and so the, the command there at the bottom shows how to transfer some file that is on ACI to your directory so that remember the period is here, the current location. Uh, and then something that, that might be helpful to you if you're trying to figure out the, the host name of the machine that you're on is to use echo dollar sign host name and that'll tell you what the, the name of the machine that you're actually on is. Uh, in addition to SCP, rsync can be very helpful for moving uh, files between systems. One of the nice things about rsync is that you can set it up so that it will only transfer files that have changed. So for example, if you're trying to back up data in some other location and you've only made small changes to a couple of files, you don't have to transfer all the data. Uh, you can set up rsync so that it will look at just the files that have been um, updated or modified since the last copy over and only copy those files. So the, the command that I'm uh, suggesting that you use is rsync and then minus a, v, z, capital P. Um, the a is for archive mode that does a couple of different things uh, that guarantees that you're using recursive so you can use directories and it also keeps the permissions that are available. W with the archive mode, it'll also look to see when the file has been modified and, and move only the files that um, have, been mod or have been updated since the last time you used rsync. The V is verbose, you can get rid of this if you don't want to see the files when they're being transferred. The Z is used compression, so what this does is it, it tags or whatever computer you're running this on a little bit more because you're actually compressing the files, but with the compression you're sending across less data. Um, and then the, the P is keep partial files, so if for whatever reason um, rsync fails, you know, you get a lost connection, let's say your Wi-Fi goes down, um, if you have that capital P in, uh, you can restart this and it'll, uh, it, it will restart from midway through whatever file you have. Especially if, uh, if you're using very large files, this can be very helpful. I have a couple of suggestions for how to use rsync. The, the first one there is taking some directory from your current location onto ACI, I, or ACI uh, using the data manager node. And then the, the second one there is um, how to bring some directory that's on ACI onto your system. In addition to these command line tools, uh, we also have um, Globus that's used for, for transferring files. Uh, the most common way to use Globus is by using their web app. Uh, this is, Globus is a, a tool that's been optimized between a lot of the large HPC centers uh, around the nation. But with that, you can also create personal endpoints on your own machine. You do have to have root access to do that on, at least on Mac, Linux, I'm, I'm not sure about Windows. Uh, but th this might be worthwhile if you're transferring a lot of data. One of the nice things about Globus is that it automatically does error checking and will restart um, automatically. Um, and so as soon as you kick off the job, you know that it's going to get done, um, even if it has to restart many times. Uh, Globus is not a Penn State tool, and so you, you actually have to um, get a Globus ID. You can link this to your Penn State ID. Uh, the instructions to do that are, are listed. We have a, a, a web page set up with some instructions for how to do that. There's a Google link to that here. Um, you can also go on to the, the Globus website itself. Uh, and when you're searching around, the, the Penn State ACI endpoints are, are listed here. Uh, you do have to search for Penn State and not PSU. Uh, that's a mistake a lot of people make. But we have three endpoints. Um, they all should be working, they're load balanced, and so even if you're choosing one of them in particular, uh, other things going on with those data manager loads are going to be load balanced, so feel free to use any of these. All right, so the last part of this talk is what to do for moving forward. We've talked about a lot of different things today. Uh, hopefully 
you're able to get started. We do have some onboarding documentation uh, in addition to the training seminars. Um, we're expanding the, the support portions of our website. If you do have technical questions though, uh, and you can't find some answers online, feel free to contact our IS Center. You can log on with our portal, send us an email, or give us a phone call during standard business hours. Um, and then also, you know, Google around. A lot of the things that, that we've been doing are not things that are particular to ACI or to Penn State. These are things that are common. You know, the Linux commands like rsync or scp, um, there's a lot of great online resources available for those. And then there's a lot of other good HPC centers around um, that run batch systems. You know, TAC or the Ohio Supercomputing Center, uh, University of Minnesota has a, a, a great website. These resources uh, might be very helpful for you if you're looking for things that are particular to your uh, domain. You know, search for a university that does what you're doing um, and maybe their HPC center has some specific uh, help for the types of codes that you're doing. Thank you for your time. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact the IS Center and happy competing.